Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jim Kircher. Today we're looking at what's in store this weekend and over the course of the coming year for the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. Joining me to talk about it are Stéphane Deneuve and Marie-Hélène Barnard. Excuse my French, it's not that good, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Stéphane is the symphony's music director designate and soon to be music director, and Marie-Hélène is its president and CEO. Thanks for joining us on the program today. Thank you. So Thank you. Stéphane, tell me this weekend's concert, which will be on St. Louis Public Radio's live symphony broadcast this Saturday eight, at 8. Uh, what's in store? Ah, there is a beautiful <laughs> narrative. Since I was dating the orchestra before getting married in September, I decided to, to uh, dedicate my uh, music director designate season to building the romance with the orchestra. And uh, we had love at first sight at the start of the season. And I remember really warmly that the, or- the, the audience uh, sung even with me, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. <laughs> that was very impressive. And I will end this season with a fantastic night. So the, the evening is dedicated to uh, the charm of uh, uh, the night. The, we will have a great soloist, Rina Charam, singing the um, uh, Sheherazade of Ravel, which is 1001 Night. And then we'll start with a fantastic new uh, piece, recent piece by Eza Pekka Salonen uh, called Nix, which is dedicated to the goddess of the night and will uh, play the fantastic of Berlioz, which is indeed an extraordinary symphony about a journey uh, of love. Marie Elaine, he's talking about sort of wooing us mm-hmm. over these four mm-hmm. uh, guest uh, conductor concerts while he's been de- de- designate. Mm-hmm. How do you see that uh, romance with St. Louis going? I think it's going very well. Um, I'm a, I guess I'm a matchmaker. <laughs> um, so I'm watching with great delight how this relationship is, is unfolding, which started in 2003. So Stefan's first visit as a guest conductor with the orchestra was uh, 15 years ago. So when um, we started um, exploring the idea of with Stefan of becoming our music director, there was this great conversation about commitment to our community and his own love for the orchestra, of course, but for St. Louis. And truly, understanding at a very deep level kind of the fabric of this community and we found that very compelling um, you know he's a remarkable musician but also that that um, expression of, of desire to engage a community truly resonated with us so we're excited to enter a, a strong marriage this September yeah the, the 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 job of music director goes beyond what we see mm-hmm. when you're on the podium oh yeah there um, how, how important is that to you I mean I, I would think sometimes it's like can I just conduct the orchestra and let somebody <laughs> else do the other stuff actually the the, the, the fact is doing music is indeed uh, uh, only a part of it but it's so exciting because I love to know for who I do music and because I love it because I have a great passion for it I want to share and so my my passion is to uh, try to make it accessible and I'm so happy that for instance uh, with my new season uh, next season we'll have new pricing and now it's possible to enter the hall for as little as $15 so basically symbolically the price of a of a movie theater ticket and uh, and we have great opportunities also for students for families and and Definitely, I want to know more all the people here. I felt extremely welcomed by the community. Um, I met many people. I visited uh, different institutions. It's very rich here. Um, we have museums, of course, the Great Zoo, the Botanical Garden. I, I visited some churches as well. And, and uh, um, I want to make music for everybody. And I really would like that everybody come to see the jewels that uh, the jewels that actually the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra is in this city. I, I'm fascinated by um, the relationship between um, the conductor and the orchestra and you talk about a match it's a good match whether it's a city or the orchestra um, I don't want names but maybe some people would but there you must have had experiences where you would say this is not an orchestra I want to work with and, and, and Look, what, what does what defines that relationship between you and an orchestra. Music is life and life is music. And indeed, there is always an external energy. And it's quite fascinating because sometimes, of course, you have the perfect match and you start a relationship with a new friend or 
even a new partner and you feel just the energy is right, the flow is right, and sometimes it doesn't work. So you cannot always explain it. But what you can testify is when there is an chemistry, where is the alchemy. And um, uh, I came here for the first time in 2003, and I kept coming back over and over because I felt that, actually, with, of course, the city that I love and, and the community. But on, on the platform with the musicians, there was something very easy. They are very friendly to me. They laugh to my friend jokes. Uh, and, uh, and we always made music with such a natural uh, feeling that um, I wanted to explore, indeed, this now uh, wedding together, musical wedding. Yeah, we're talking with St. Louis Symphony Orchestra music director Desna Dick, Stefan Deneuve, who becomes music director in the next season, and president and CEO Marie Helene Bernard. We're talking about what's in store this weekend and over the course of the coming year for the orchestra. Marie Helene, um, I know your job has a lot to do with the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You have to keep the orchestra financially healthy, you have mm -hmm. to deal with contracts, you mm -hmm. have to deal with roofs and heating and air conditioning and all mm -hmm. of that. But it seems to me that the biggest decision a, a CEO, a board, whomever will make is who the music director is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but Stefan, I don't think, was a dark horse candidate here. He didn't come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is about music. So artistic planning is, is core to what we do. Um, and it's, it's a partnership. So it's a musical dialogue that we engage the community um, into and then the musical dialogue that we and with our team that we nurture over time. But the music is where everything starts. Everything behind the scene is what supports the institutional health of, of an organization. So I think that um, Stefan's understanding of the business of, of, of orchestra management the behind the scene is critical but I think essentially it's his artistic vision and leadership and you'll see it next season in the Franco-American theme in the various ways that he's engaging artists that have been in St. Louis for many, many years, um, composers that have been featured and yet exploring new relationships, which is really important to continue to um, inspire new artistic ideas. Yeah, I'd like to invite our listeners to join in this conversation because they may have some questions for mm -hmm. you. If you have a question or comment for our guests, give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. Let's talk about the French composers. Uh, first of all, I have a question. When you guys are together in a room, do you speak French or do you speak English? <laughs> we do both, actually. We do both. Yeah. It's, it switches very strangely from one to the other. I don't know exactly what is the logic, but uh, yes, sometimes. I mean, we do speak French together, but I have to say she has a very interesting French. She has, she has a Quebecois accent. Right, so she's your French-Canadian, so I My was My French is better than his. Yes, yes that's, that's right. okay. <laughs> that's what I was meaning because, you know, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, uh, the accent of... Um, of the Quebecois, actually, what um, what what we were sp speaking two centuries or three centuries ago, so uh, it's like speaking to a queen. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so queen. tell me about the, the the French composers. You know, a few a few names come to mind. I'm not going to throw them out because I'll leave one out. But uh, there must be some there that are underappreciated, underperformed, that you would like to bring to this community. Yes, I mean, I, I, I am French. I love French music. I love the colors of French music. And uh, I will bring to St. Louis, indeed, some composers that are maybe a little bit less familiar, like a, a, a very um, uh, modern one, uh, living one, called Guillaume Connaisson, which we will feature next year. Um, but... Um, Actually, the, the fact is, I wanted this season, the new season, to be a gift to St. Louis and to honor the arch between the two countries, America and France. So what is, uh, I think, very interesting in our new season is that we will perform music uh, from American composers that have been influenced by France and the opposite, French music that has been influenced by America, mainly, of course, jazz, which is so important as well in this city. So um, this season will explore that in a, in a way to unify and do what uh, music do, does best, which is to, uh, to, to make people together, because I so believe that music is the shortest way from one heart to another. And that's what you can experience so vividly when you are in the role. So it is very unique in a day and age where, where you have, of course, uh, uh, a lot of time spent behind a screen, you know, be it your cell phone or your computer, I think it's very important to know that there is uh, a soul 2.0 experience, which is 
to be just together and to experience music together. And so this season will be uh, indeed uh, uh, sh sharing music together with this idea of an arch, you, you see what I mean, uh, yeah. between Franco and American culture. And you know when you say new or contemporary, some people cringe ah, a little bit. No. <laughs> I would like to say some people cringed <laughs> with past tense because, look, this is the good news that I really want to share. Indeed, this uh, you're cringing... You're not going to force feed us something, no, is that what you're saying? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm in a mission to create a trust because I have good news. There is today a lot of great music that is composed, that is in sync with our time, and which is accessible, emotional, tuneful, melodic, and... It's just a matter of choosing the right music. And yes, this cringing comes from somewhere. Yes, after the Second World War, there has been some modern music of the time, <laughs> which is not so modern anymore, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, some um, some avant-garde music that has been indeed exploring some roads that I think were dead ends, and which was, of course, very difficult to listen to. And this is changing so much. And I really want to create this rapport with the aud audience that if I conduct a piece, it's because I believe not only I like it, but they will like it, and the orchestra will like playing it, and they will like to hear it again as well. It's not played only once. So I'm in a mission to build a new repertoire which can stand the, the test of the future and, 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 and to find the right pieces, the creme de la creme pieces, that will be indeed the future repertoire. And next season, we have a lot of uh, composers, actually, uh, uh, 16 pieces of our, our times. And, and I really encourage the audience to come with an open mind and trust me, they will love it. Accessibility is an interesting point here, Maria. It's it's very important to us for for many reasons because we want to engage all generations, and we're really uh, intentional about creating, um, offering programming that's accessible uh, for all. Going back to the commission, also we are committed to reviving works that this organization has commissioned in the past. If you look back at, you know, the many works that during Sutkin's era and later that this organization has invested in. I think we, we need to make a commitment to, to, to great composers to bring their uh, works back. So I think that's very important. And accessibility is not just the way that we program, it's the pricing, as Stefan mentioned, but it's the way we talk about the music. It's the way we make people feel comfortable about things, exploring music that they might not be familiar with. Um, you know, people often feel daunted by, by listening to music that they have n not heard before, and it's and it's same for for us, we're musicians, and we need to listen over and over and over again. Music appreciation comes with an acceptance, but also we want people to feel relaxed, and it's okay not to like, it's okay to just want to hear it again. It's okay. So this, I think Stefan will approach this in a, the right way. Look, in, the, in, in my very first <coughs> concert as music director, you will hear a world premiere by Kevin Putz, who is a native uh, St. Louisian mm -hmm. composer, and who got the Pulitzer Prize for a very good reason because he wrote a fantastic opera um, uh, and we uh, we will actually perform later in the season the suite out of this opera and it's so beautifully melodic so full of heart so tender and and in the same concert my very first concert you will hear a piece by Jennifer Higdon a comp living composer from Philadelphia called Blue Cathedral this piece has been played today more than 600 times by more than 300 orchestras. It's a hit. It's a piece that um, audiences love to hear. It's a beautiful piece. And also, uh, my artist in residence, Jean-Yves Thibaudet, will play The Shining One, a concerto by a French composer, living composer, Guillaume Connaisson, which he has played already in many orchestras across the US in Europe. What I mean is the symphonic music is a living art form with great new music, that is actually really able to please audience of today. And um, if people that come in my first week don't like it, I pay back the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What's been interesting, I think, Maria Lynn, um, over the years is the, the movie scores mm -hmm. that uh, you've done. I particularly mm -hmm. like the silent films, so yes. I don't have to listen to the, uh, <laughs> try to listen to the dialogue, yeah. but to appreciate the mm -hmm. film and, and mm -hmm. the music that goes mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant idea mm -hmm. in terms of getting people in mm -hmm. Um, two reasons. One, to hear this orchestra perform, and two, the music's 
pretty good. Yes, there's great, there's amazing uh, film composers, um, and the music is quite phenomenal. And for a lot of families, it's been a really wonderful way to introduce reintroduce themselves to to the live orchestra in support of a movie, but also to bring their families to it. Just last week, when we premiered, we gave the world premiere of a um, song cycle by Jeff Beale, Slatkin. It was a gift to to, uh, Leonard Slatkin to mark the 50th um, uh, anniversary of his debut with us. Jeff Beale is one of the most established film composers in L.A. I mean, he's very, very prolific, and he wrote this beautiful song cycle for us. And it's an example of how you know, film music and composers that that work in TV or the film industry are are as creative and as as good as others. So it's definitely um, something that has helped us um, get the interest and attention of new audiences. Yeah, it's a great it's a great entree, mm-hmm. a gateway. Yeah, uh, you know, so many people, um, young people or adults, have said, "Well, boy, when I heard Peter and the Wolf, that's mm-hmm. when I first Mm-hmm. became interested and I began mm-hmm. began to understand. And I think we, we often forget that the what we consider classical music was popular music mm-hmm. at some point. Mm-hmm. And, of and for for the masses. You you don't want people throwing vegetables if they don't like it or whatever they did back then. <laughs> <laughs> but it still is. It, it it needs to be, I think, accessible, and people need to feel a little more comfortable in a symphony hall. And I think you've been able to do that mm-hmm. quite quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I'm going to bring up something. This is something new. You have a an artist in residence mm-hmm. coming in, uh, pianist uh, Jean Yves Thibaudet. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've had uh, composers in residence, conductors. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this the first time then for an artist in residence? And what does exactly that mean then? Well, the, the idea is very simple, is that we have a, a, a extended residency with an artist that will actually be more accessible uh, because you can see the artist, uh, he or she, uh, regularly in one season. And also, uh, this artist will be not only doing concertos, but also, in the case of Jean-Yves Thibaudet, will do um, uh, some, uh, some chamber music. Um, at the Was- Washington University Hall, and uh, um, he, he will also participate to a, to another uh, special event for us, which is a Ravel Journey. We will do later, uh, at the end of the season, something quite special, which is a, a symphonic play. So what does that mean? Is that there will be actors on stage, also singers, also our artist in residence, Jean-Yves Thibaudet, this great pianist, and we will actually put music in perspective just with a, 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 a new art form that uh, that mix indeed uh, theater and music in order to put the music in a context. It's very entertaining. It's what I call edutainment. It's uh, kind of educative, but with such an entertaining feeling that uh, that you, you, you are just uh, entertained. And, um, uh, and I think this is really um, something very dear to me. I mean, I think we, we can learn at any age. Uh, I don't like to say that uh, there is uh, children and adults. I think we all uh, aging children, and uh, and I think we should stay curious and open to learn things. That that's what we can also offer with this initiative. Yeah, and I've my you know my experience. Uh, I, I often go with my daughter, who's a big fan of the, the the symphony. And when she gets a little more money, uh, she'll get that season ticket back again. But we've both been surprised. There are pieces we've thought, well, mm, not so much. But other pieces were like, wow, surprisingly really enjoyable. And of course, these are the pieces we don't know and we're not, we're not familiar with. But we talked about getting kids interested. I know there's a lot of um, outreach engagement in, in mm-hmm. the community, but Stefan, did you grow up in a musical household? Were you, you know, destined to become uh, a, a, a concert pianist or a conductor, <laughs> or were you just a kid who was good at music? No, certainly not, actually. My father did play a tiny bit of tuba in an amateur way, but not, not a lot at all. And uh, um, and, and we you're from a small, a smaller town. A very France. small yeah. town indeed in the north of France, close to the Belgian border. Um, but uh, I was lucky enough that uh, in uh, the school that I was going, which was a Catholic school, there was an old nun playing the organ, and I was fascinated by the sound of the organ, and I was hiding, and she once found me. And, uh, and uh, seeing my interest, uh, she said, well, you should start the piano with me, and I started with her. I was 10, so not very young, and... Uh, uh, she found out that I had good ears, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and she 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 started me, and and then I became of course so passionate that it made music my life. But um, uh, but what is fascinating with music is that um, it can f- really fall in any kind of families. You have of course musical families where everybody kind of plays something, but suddenly you can have 
fantastic soloist, uh, extraordinary interpreter or conductor, that just with no music around. So it's quite mysterious and and it's uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, and and again, it's. Um I think I just want to compliment uh, both of you in, in terms of, of bringing this and creating some new excitement because music is an exciting thing. It's not it's not stuck in the past, and I think the the orchestra over the years and and with the new music director, I think will continue to uh, surprise us and, and perhaps challenge us. So, uh, you've got your final uh, guest conductor concert uh, this weekend. It'll be on St. Louis Public Radio's live symphony broadcast this Saturday at 8 o'clock. So I want to thank Stefan Deneve and Marie Helene Barnard of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra for being with us today. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Merci. Tomorrow on St. Louis on the Air, we'll talk with local author Terry Baker Mulligan, whose new book about raising boys is being released on Mother's Day. And two of the progressive women candidates featured in the new Netflix documentary, Knock Down the House, Corey Bush and Amy Villella will be sharing their stories. Podcast episodes of St. Louis on the Air are available at stlpublicradio.org, or you can subscribe for free to Apple Podcasts, the Apple Podcast app, or wherever you get your podcasts. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thanks for listening. I'm Jim Kircher. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts.